Thank you very much, Fathers. It's a really great honor for me to be able to organize this conference. And though it's a lot of work, it's really um, very grateful to the order and to all of you who've made the trip here. Thomism after Vatican II. By the end of the Second Vatican Council, it had, been cu it had become customary for many attending the event to speak of the minority party and the majority. This terminology is employed unselfconsciously, for example, in the Journal of Yves Congar, as he writes in 1940, 1964, and 1965. They seem to just be using the terminology among themselves at the Council. Both parties, if there really were such, were no doubt each numeric minorities within the larger whole, but they represented ideological tendencies vying for influence. In retrospect, we can say that they were divided by a common question. How should the church understand herself and her mission in the modern world in the wake of the decline of ancient monarchical regimes and the rise of modern secular democracies? Both sides were, in a certain sense, seeking to preserve the fullness of Catholic teaching and to promote that teaching in the modern world. Both longed for the reunion of the church with the predominant culture, but with differing points of emphasis. One tendency was to see this aim in primarily defensive terms, the minority emphasizing the preservation of authentic intellectual and spiritual traditions over against an errant modern secularism. The other, the other tendency, the seeming majority, was to see this aim in dialogical and in a certain way primarily optimistic terms, seeking opportunities in the signs of the times for a way to bring the church's message to modern man. Neither side in this engagement wanted to do away with the privileged study of Aquinas in the life of the church, but they tended to envisage that study in fairly different terms. Here, one might consider two of the most balanced voices from either side. First then, consider Cornelius Fabro. The renowned Italian Thomistic scholar was asked to compose a votum in the early 60s as part of the commission on seminary education that would eventually produce optatum totius. Fabro, in that votum, predicted that in the coming years there would continue to develop in European civilization a post-religious subjectivism that he denoted by the term immanentism. This cultural tendency, he argued, would lead to a twofold error. On the one hand, an extreme form of skeptical rationalism that takes any appeal to absolute revelation to be an imposition upon the freedom of human consciousness to derive for itself the content of personal truth claims. On the other hand, an extreme fideism, a theology that takes refuge in the integrity of traditional forms of thought without due reference to metaphysical realism, the philosophical study of nature, ethical objectivity, or a healthy confidence in the positive relation between supernatural faith and natural reason. To remedy what he sees as this two, two-fold tendency towards subjectivism and fideism, which Fabro warned would enter deeply into the life of future clergy as well as the Catholic laity, he counsels the study of St. Thomas in both seminaries and Catholic universities, the consideration of the first principles of speculative and practical reason, the study of metaphysics and of the constitution of the human person in Thomistic terms knowledge of the arguments for the existence of God, consideration of the relation of creation to the modern sciences, and so forth. Secondly, consider Yves Congar. Interestingly, Congar saw the council as a kind of vindication of Thomism, at least in its spirit or method of procedure. And just to note, this is really quite different from Joseph Ratzinger, who thought that the event signaled a return to an older patristic model of engagement with culture, rather than that model represented by scholasticism. In an essay published in 1967, Congar contrasted two visions of Thomism at the Council. One particularly focused upon, quote, a system of abstractions and of prefabricated solutions to intellectual problems, close quote. 
Congar associates this form of Thomism with Billuart as a paradigmatic example. He claims that it developed out of the long-standing rivalries between religious orders and their theological schools, and that it is more interested in inter-ecclesial quarrels than in real engagement in evangelization. Catholic intellectual life is most healthy, by contrast, when it engages with the real problems of its age and helps to make the gospel most accessible to those both inside and outside the church. In other words, Catholic theology should be missionary in nature. Congar claims that the council follows the example of Aquinas in just this regard, now to quote him a little bit extensively. St. Thomas was not a man who repeated categories and conclusions supposedly formulated once and for all. He spent his life seeking out new texts, in overseeing the production of new translations, in dialogue with all the heretics of his time, those who did not think like him either within or outside the church. The council is right, Congar adds, that we should not repeat his theses, but rather place ourselves in his school of thought. Close citation. In other words, what we should do today, we should do today what Aquinas did in his own age by engaging with the thought world in questions of our time. And Congar then gives a succinct list of the main theological issues of the day as he sees them in 1967. And what is his list, incidentally? How theology should engage with modern exegesis, the tasks of ecumenism with the Orthodox and the Reformed, the questions posed by Marxism, depth psychology, the birth control pill, and the atomic bomb. Nothing transpired after the council precisely as, as anyone had expected it to, and great changes occurred to give but a partial list. In 1968, the sexual revolution, the, the decline of religious practice in Europe and North America, the expansion of Catholicism in the Southern Hemisphere, the fall of Marxism, the victory of secular liberalism and capitalism, the postmodern critique of philosophical modernity, the effects of computer technology on modern communication, the decline of the Cold War and the rise of terrorism, uh, local terrorism and its effect on modern politics. But also amidst all of this, I would say, the pontificate of Pope John Paul II, who offered an intellectually compelling and spiritually profound vision of Catholicism at the heart of the modern world. Without seeking to evaluate here the many facets of the council and its aftermath, I would simply like to say at this juncture that Fabro and Congar are both right, but each under a different aspect. For one, Thomism is above all an integral way of seeing the world rightly. It is a science and a form of wisdom. For the other, it represents an intellectual stance of the Catholic intellectual life, a vitality of engagement with the contemporary issues of one's age in the service of evangelization. So you have really two poles of emphasis there, integrity of principles, vitality of engagement. Evidently, no opposition between the two is required, but there is the need to understand them in a proper order. Toward that end, let me reflect briefly on each point with a view toward answering the question which I've posed implicitly by the title of this essay. What should Thomism aspire to do after Vatican II? Tur toward the first point, let's consider the integrity of Thomism. What is it, quid est? First, we must say that it is simply painfully minimalistic to say that Thomism should represent to us merely the valid aspiration to do in our own time what Aquinas did in his, to create out of the dialectical web of opinions that currently occupy our own cultural space a unique Christian vision. That might be an aspiration inspired by the example of Aquinas or Hegel or neither, but it certainly is not a stable or integral form of thought per se. It is nothing like the perennial philosophy that is alluded to in recent ecclesial documents like Optatum Totius and Fides et Ratio, obviously stronger in the latter than in the former, which explicitly advocate for the study and transmission of the philosophical and theological patrimony of Thomas Aquinas. 
But on the other hand, I think it's in danger to define Thomism merely by reference to Aquinas' most unique philosophical and theological theses, whose teachings, those teachings which set him apart even in the 13th century from his scholastic contemporaries. I'm alluding to theses like those of the real distinction between essay and essence in all created being, a kind of unique thesis very dear to Gilson, or his particular doctrine of participation dear to Fabro, or his affirmation of the soul as the subsistent form of the body such that the person is one composite substance composed of body and soul, which Joseph Ratzinger emphasizes in his book on eschatology. You could add his teaching on the Asian intellect as the natural principle of human cognition and differentiation from Scotus. Or in theology, his treatment of the persons of the Trinity as subsistent relations, his doctrine of infused virtues, his particular theology of transubstantiation, his theory of the character of priestly ordination, and so on. We could multiply places where he's very original. Of course, these insights are part of the Thomistic heritage, but taken in themselves, they would represent too narrow a definition, and I would even say kind of psychologically insecure and negative definition. How is Aquinas originally not like anyone else? Only in this way is he really important. Instead, perhaps we might say the following. First, philosophically speaking, Thomism is broadly conceived, I realize this is controversial, a Christian Aristotelianism based in the classic philosophical patrimony, expanded organically and developed insightfully in the light of Christian revelation. Thus, the Thomistic heritage typically transmits certain principles that derive originally from Aristotle himself and that are held not only by Aquinas, but which are common to the broader scholastic community as well. I'm thinking of things like the epistemological distinction between the speculative and practical intellect, which of course you can't take for granted today, the study of the categorical modes of being and the four causes, the hylomorphic theory of matter and form as the co-constituent principles of nature, the understanding of the soul as the form of a living body, the distinction between substance and accidents, actuality and potency, a teleological theory of human agency, a virtue-based account of morality. At the same time, Thomism surely does entail a unique account of this broader philosophical patrimony that is marked radically to its very depths by the Christian tradition and by Aquinas' original genius and insight in interpreting that tradition arguably in the best way, in the best instantiation we have. Consider in this respect then the contextualization of the types of doctrines that were mentioned before. St. Thomas's metaphysics of the real distinction, his very unique interpretation of the transcendentals, his philosophical treatment of creation, his peculiar arguments for the incorruptibility and subsistence after death of the human rational soul itself simultaneously the subsistent form of the human body. Aquinas' own very original count of the human emotions. His beautiful theory of the various moments of human free action and the treatment of moral objects, ends, and circumstances. We could ex continue to expand such a list, but the main point, however, is the following. Thomism does contain, philosophically speaking, a coherent body of doctrine, an account of the structure of reality, and is at the same time well grounded in the larger tradition of European philosophy. It cannot be reduced to a sociological motif or a merely formal intellectual aspiration. To understand what Aquinas is arguing about the nature of reality, one must develop a habit of consideration of reality itself, seeking to understand if the analysis given by the Thomistic tradition makes sense, is defensible, is organically unified or not. The truth is at stake and not mere procedure. But at the same time, Aquinas' thinking is rooted in a, a larger tradition of conversation. It does not emerge from nowhere to be interpreted only by a hermeneutic of discontinuity with all his forebears and successors, as if we had to be wed to some kind of, I think, overly stark Heideggerian meta-narrative, wherein everyone has forgotten the essential except Aquinas and a few privileged modern interpreters who have rediscovered his true genius. I'm, I'm really nervous about the idea that we have to dismiss 800 years of European Christian intellectual life uh, at the expense of making Aquinas seem like the original genius, which he is. 
I don't think you. I don't think you have to choose between uh, that kind of. You know, I, th I think it could be more off affirmative of many of the great contributions of other Christian thinkers between Bonaventure and Henry de Lubac. Second, theologically speaking, Aquinas' theology takes its point of departure from the teaching of Christ and the apostles. I'm sp speaking of Aquinas the theologian. That teaching that has been transmitted and understood by the church. Aquinas as a theologian is a model in his own right qua theologian, and he is cons constantly seeking to understand the principles of divine revelation and the intrinsic order uh, to these principles. His thought in this, is, in this respect is both historical and analytic, patristic and biblical, biblical and patristic, but also scholastic and rational and demonstrative, also very intuitive at times and mystical. Reading Aquinas teaches one how to think theologically in a balanced way. And to say that Aquinas is a great theologian is not to deny, but is in fact also to affirm that he's a great philosopher. For as he himself points out, Sacra Doctrina ordinarily makes use of a number of philosophical, historical, and scientific theories not derived immediately from revelation, but which enter into the speculative habit of theology, just because theology can and must make use of the truth of those teachings. A clear example would pertain to the humanity of Jesus Christ. God has become human. But then what does it mean to be human? What should we believe about the body and soul of Christ, his human intellect and will, the nature of his human death and resurrection? Here, inevitably, philosophical views impact our particular exposition of the theological mystery. And simultaneously, the consideration of the mystery of God continually invites every person, qua philosopher, to adjust or rethink his or her views. There's a virtuous circle of interaction. When we speak of a Thomistic theological tradition, then, we are denoting something complex. Certainly, it is a kind of robust scholastic theology, historically well informed at the service of the magisterium. It is affected in distinct ways by Aquinas' philosophical choices, but it's also characterized by Aquinas' distinct theological insights and acumen. Father Norbert del Prado made this argument many years ago in his famous work on Thomism as a Christian philosophy. Del Prado argued there, for example, that Aquinas' metaphysics of the distinction in creatures of essay and essence and of divine simplicity contributed in important ways to his articulation of the mystery of the divine persons of the Trinity as subsistent relations. God is simple without composition of essay and essence or composition of any kind. And simultaneously, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each the one God, the Creator. Therefore, there is nothing that distinguishes the persons of the Trinity with respect to essence or existence, and each person must be considered in his subsistence to possess the simple plenitude of the divine being. Consequently, the persons are distinguished only by their relations of origin, which are interpreted in light of the processions of the Son from the Father, and of the spirit from the Father and the Son. The persons are then subsistent relations. Each one is from another in all that he is, and each one contains in himself, well, the Son and the, and the Spirit are from another in all that each is, and each one contains in himself the perfection of the divine essence, the Father giving the Son to be eternally by way of generation, the Father and the Son giving the Spirit to be eternally by way of spiration. In his notion of the persons as subsistent relations, Aquinas offered the church then a particularly balanced form of Trinitarian monotheism because he managed to acknowledge in a very profound way simultaneously both the absolute primacy of the divine unity and the absolute primacy of the distinction of the divine persons. Arguably, this articulation of the mystery of God has not been surpassed by any other exponent of the doctrine. My point in giving this example is not to claim that Aquinas' theology is special simply because of his metaphysics. I certainly wasn't saying that. Nor is the point to claim that all Catholic theologians need to be Thomists. To affirm that is to mistake Thomism for the doctrine of the church, which it clearly is not. Instead, the point is simply to underscore by these limited examples that Thomism has an essence. Thomism has an essence. It constitutes an identifiable intellectual patrimony that deeply affects the long-term health 
and stability of the Catholic intellectual heritage in the dual domains of philosophy and theology. If Thomism has a role to play in the age we live in since the Second Vatican Council, this is clearly due to the integrity of the principles of Thomistic thought as a way of thinking about reality. And I say this then following Cornelius Fabro. Meanwhile, Congar is concerned to categorize the contribution of Thomism in terms of dialogue with the thought world of one's age, and I've recast this categorization in terms of vitality. A living Thomism must not only transmit the integral knowledge of principles, but also engage contemporary issues in the service of evangelization. Here I think we should be careful. Being in dialogue should not be confused with authentic vitality. In fact, dialogue is not always a sign of vitality. It's sometimes a sign of capitulation and of decline. But what Congar is rightly denoting, it seems to me, is the following. You don't win over the culture of your age unless you can solve its internal intellectual problems, or at least address them seriously. And this includes, of course, the culture of the church. At the time of the Second Vatican Council, the church was faced by a number of important modern theological difficulties. Whether or not one is satisfied by the solutions that were offered by the likes of de Lubac and Ratzinger, or Rahner and Chenu, whether by the Communio or the Concilium, it's clearly these people who were offering solutions. It's not enough to have all the right ideas and to harbor them defensively unless you can also communicate a renewed sense of their vitality and helpfulness in the context in which they are needed. In other words, we need articulations of Thomism sufficiently concent concentrated and integral so as to be real and useful, but also accessible and pertinent, evangelical and hopeful, so as to be missionary. We might argue that in the past 50 years it has become, since I've said nothing controversial so far, I'm going to start saying some things that are a little more hypothetical. <laughs> We might argue that in the past 50 years, it has become painfully apparent that many of the influential theologies of the post-conciliar period are in fact not today, not today, in any position to attempt to replace Thomism in the post-conciliar period as a normative guide to modern Catholic intellectual life. The theological anthropology of Karl Rahner, which uh, very greatly influenced the life of the church in the 1970s and 80s, I think presumed as its backdrop a kind of modern European intellectual consensus, a post kantian intellectual culture with ongoing influences from a conversation with Hegel and Heidegger. That consensus has since perished in the flames of postmodernism, which was not foreseen uh, by the people who were uh, pro advancing the anthropology under consideration. That consensus is also perished by the rise of analytic philosophy and the return of scientific positivism. And these various influences, of course, don't overlap with one another in many respects. Students in the contemporary university do not suffer from overcommitment to the categories of an intellectually stifling pre-modern metaphysics from which they need to be liberated by a, a post-Kantian modern resolution of the terms of the faith. They suffer from the lack of any normative philosophical orientation or basic formation. Typically, they're offered no unifying account of reality that would span across the diversity of their intellectual disciplines. And indeed, where would they get one? University culture today is characteristically dominated by constructivistic postmodernism and scientific positivism both of which offer very truncated visions of reality and which are in fact profoundly incompatible with one another. Students often long for some way to make sense of the unity of philosophical experience so as to see how the world might have some analyzable overarching meaning. And if they're Catholic, they want to see how the various disciplines of learning, whether scientific, philosophical, or literary, relate to the theological tenets of their faith. And strangely, in this context, the Thomism that was viewed by many as a cultural impasse at the time of the Council increasingly can be understood to be of a unique relevance. I think it's ironic, but I really think it's true, that a book like Maritain's Degrees of Knowledge, at, at least in what it aspires to, is perhaps of the most critical import just in the juncture in which we live today. 
I'm not saying that Thomism should be presented under a triumphalistic banner as the solution to all life's intellectual prom uh, problems. I, I don't believe that. I think that would be kind of crazy given our cultural situation. And I'm not saying that the 24 Thomistic theses are the ready-made response to the thought of Michel Foucault, although I think a very strong argument for that could in fact be made. But, <laughs> but I am, I'm saying something more measured, despite myself. <laughs> I'm just saying that Thomism in our own age has become one of the only plausible contenders left that offers an authentic vision of the sapiential unity of human knowledge amidst the diversity of university disciplines. Now, politically, to be sure, our situation is one of cultural disenfranchisement. We are complete outsiders, an underground movement frequently, to be truth be told, a little bit unwelcome in the university. But the rivals who today are offering either the church or the modern world a plausible narrative of the intellectual life are diminishing and are not having such an easy time themselves. As a Dominican friar of the Toulouse province said in the 1970s during an episodic period of particular turmoil, brothers, things are bad here, but by the grace of God, they are worse elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> If, if your goal is to win over the larger culture today, inside the church or outside of it, it's not much easier today to be a Kantian, a Balthazarian, a Marxist, a logical positivist, a Derridian, than to be a Thomist. In this very heterogeneous landscape, there's an increasingly level playing field. And in that case, it's not so bad to have Thomas Aquinas on your team. So what central issues does the Catholic Church face within our larger culture today? I've mentioned one above, which is the problem of the unity of the sciences in the modern university. We might briefly add a selective list of three others. First, no Catholic theology, uh, this is a strong claim, but I, d I really think this is true, that no Catholic theology in the 20th century seriously engaged with modern cosmology and evolutionary biology. Today, these are the disciplines that vie to stand at the center of academic culture. And those who would advocate for a militant secularism, a new atheism, commonly claim to be the true advocates of science. But at the same time, it's quite unclear within the larger university culture what philosophy, if any, might be employed to rightly interpret the discoveries of, mo of the modern scientific revolution. 20th century Thomas of the River Forest School claimed that Thomism could offer needed grounding to the study of modern physics, as well as an appreciation of the role of evolutionary biology and psychology for an understanding of the human person, and yet still underscore the uniqueness of the spiritual principle in the human person, and the importance of metaphysics and a philosophical understanding of the doctrine of creation. Modern analytic philosophers typically want to see themselves as the key philosophers of the scientific age, but simultaneously they are struggling incessantly to understand basic problems of causation, the attribution of natural kinds, the reality of cosmic order and what it might signify, the unity of living forms as distinct from non-living forms, the reality of animal sentience, intentionality, and human rationality. I mean, they have a lot of problems. They're actually aware, when you talk to a lot of them about these things, that they have enormous difficulties even to get these basic things up and running, which would be necessary for them to really vie to say that they are the, the, scien the sort of philosophical interpreters of the modern scientific age. But the fact that they're engaging with this stuff makes them in some ways also allies and interlocutors. In the spirit of river forest Thomism, I say in the spirit, uh, not in the letter necessarily. That's up to different people's opinions. There's a wonderful opportunity for a younger generation of Thomists to weigh in on these topics philosophically and theologically for the good of the church and the health of the greater culture at large. Second, sexuality and gender. The teachings of the church that will remain the most contested or s despised in modern Western culture are those that challenge directly the lifestyle changes that have emerged from the sexual revolution. Increasingly, they, ma they mark out Catholic Christians as unintelligible subjects in the modern secular state and even as potential enemies. We have here only to name fundamental teachings that we know are frequently misunderstood or dismissed. 
the dignity of human life from conception to natural death, marriage as the morally appropriate context of sexual love, the heterosexual, the heterosexual and procreative character of marriage, the intrinsically problematic character of contraception, the celibate priesthood, the all-male priesthood. And in addition, we can note the expanding set of bioethical issues where the culture embraces practices the church cannot condone, in vitro fertilization, same-sex adoption, the day after pill, prenatal eugenics. Such, pra such practices are becoming statistically normal. Now these neuralgic issues are all related in some way to the theme of sexuality and gender. They touch upon the very nature of the human person as an animal who is capable of serving God in his or her body, as an inherently political animal who is born into and cared for by a family, and as a fallen spiritual animal in many ways wounded and weak, capable of sexual godlessness and sexual selfishness, but also in need of mercy and compassion. We need to discuss these issues, but also resituate their consideration within a deeper treatment of the human person, a recovery of the sense of nature and its beauty, a discussion of human happiness, of the virtues and vices, a treatment of the relationship between God and the human body, and the spiritual character of human oblative love. Clearly, we cannot simply ignore such topics, either individually or as an order, and hope that they disappear or that someone else who is braver and perhaps less nuanced than us will deal with them. I mean, I know that we say in the order, but these are sensitive, difficult, psychologically complex things, and we have to be nuanced, and it's the gift of our order that we're nuanced. But the church is also in need of clarity, and the best clarity is a clarity that's nuanced. And I, I know that we can just watch certain modern societies in the church and certain modern prelatures in the church battle these things out on the left and the right, but I think we have to bring the wisdom of the tradition to bear on them. It used to be a question of how Catholic intellectuals could effectively change the dominant views of the mainstream culture by appeal to our ethical tradition, but today it's increasingly a question of whether the dominant culture will even allow Catholics to articulate and practice what they believe. It may seem that on these difficult subjects we lack sufficient allies in the larger culture, and that is true to be sure. However, the permissive world we live in also gradually gives rise to many profoundly disillusioned, wounded people who are seekers, who are looking for a deeper moral formation, even on all these controversial issues. If we provide a framework that is at once coherent and demanding, but also rationally accessible and compassionate, we will be preparing a counter alternative to the predominant culture, a kind of potent intellectual remnant. We have at our disposal, at our disposal in this regard the great resources of Aquinas' account of the human person as body and soul, spirit and sense, and his accompanying teleological conception of freedom, eudaimonistic ethics, and virtue theory. If this is articulated in a way that is accessible and rationally sensitive and authentically spiritual, it is powerful and compelling. Lastly, theology today lacks unity in the way that it explains the central mysteries of the Christian faith. Marie-Dominique Chenu sought to remedy this challenge of unity in modern theology by referring to Aquinas' exitus reditus schema, all comes from God and all returns to him. Chenu sought to read Aquinas so as to procure a theology of the divine economy and of human history. This is meant to provide a framework for the tasks of theology in the historically minded hermeneutical age in which we live. Theology then becomes a kind of meta-history. Now, it, it should be said that historical studies in scripture, patristics, medieval and modern thought, and in the domain of Thomism itself, have greatly enriched the intellectual patrimony of our time. And such studies, I believe personally, are essential to a healthy theology. They give us intellectual orientation so that we perceive better the intellectual conditions of the historical time in which Revelation was composed in the biblical works and in which the tradition developed 
as well as the intellectual landscape of our own era, and it is very dangerous not to know where you are in history. And all this study uh, can readily lead also to speculative knowledge, since the recovery of the past opens us up to a principled, profound analysis of reality, as it has been rightly understood by our forebears. Historical study is not at enmity with speculative theology when rightly understood. But we do live in a time when the study of the structure of the mystery of the faith, it's, uh, of the faith is itself neglected. Just was, what does it mean to speak about creation? What is the essential meaning of the old law as related to the new law? What is justification and sanctification? How does justification relate to merit essentially? How ought we to understand the ontology of the incarnation? or the instrumental causality of the sacraments. We can study all these questions in a historical optic, to be sure, and we can do so in the service of the Catholic to mystic theology as such. But at some point, we have to answer the questions. And if I may say so, academic theology today is largely in the habit of not answering the questions, but of merely rehearsing the historical opinions. What Richard of St. Victor thought about the sacraments is a very profound thing and very worth studying, but it's not sufficient simply to study that without getting to the eventual terminus. It's a mistake to try to overcorrect in the other direction. What we need is a historically sound approach to the Bible, the fathers, the medievals, and the moderns, but one which seeks to find the speculative answers to the deepest theological questions and to present those two persons of our time. This is especially the case when it comes to teaching seminarians, Dominicans, future priests, those who need a grounding in authentic theology and in the contemplation of the mystery of God so that they can be formed in it and transmit it through apostolic preaching. In saying all this, I'm only repeating what one finds in Optatum, Optatum Totius, paragraph 16. Ultimately, quoting the, the document, Ultimately, in order to throw as full a light as possible on the mysteries of salvation, students should learn to examine more deeply through speculative labor and with St. Thomas as master all aspects of the Christian mysteries and to perceive their interconnection. One thing we can do as a service to the vitality of theology in our own age, then, is to preserve the classical practice of theology as a science that peers into the mysteries of faith. The scientific and contemplative character of theology is most essential to the intellectual life of the church. It's alive in the order. It's alive and practiced by the people in this room. And it's increasingly a rarity in the church. Or at least it's something, I think there's great openness to it, but I think an awareness of how to do it is lacking often. To conclude, Pope Paul VI said that in the modern age, people will believe in the gospel when they see people giving their lives for it. There can be little doubt that we live in an age that gives more importance to the witness of life of the Catholic religious than to intellectual arguments. Interestingly, witness in this respect the initial popular reaction to Pope Francis. This might seem in some ways like a fundamental problem for the revival of Thomism. Isn't it, after all, all too conceptual? But I don't think that's true, actually. Consider this. Scholasticism was a form of thought that developed in large part in religious communities and which was employed not only to sustain the life of those communities, but also their missionary activity across the span of the world. When Franciscans were formed in the thought of Bonaventure or Scotus and Jesuits in the thought of Suarez or Vasquez, this formation was meant to equip them to engage with all facets of reality, both in the religious life of Europe and abroad as missionaries. What was aimed at was an integrated life of religious witness that, was, that also was accompanied by a profound speculative analysis of reality understood in light of God, the most holy trinity. That integrity of spiritual life and intellectual vision then is something precious and it must be said increasingly rare. And I don't say this with any happiness actually. You don't see today many Scotist Franciscans or Suarezian Jesuits, let alone communities of them interested in undertaking an integral way of life that is integrating the scholastic formation with a way of life. 
And yet, brothers, amazingly, what I am referring to still subsists in the church in a particular way in the life of the Dominican order, where the speculative study of Thomism can still be found as something integrated within a collective evangelical witness of religious life. This is something of tremendous existential vitality and import in our world today. The era, I didn't say error, I said the era, the era of post-conciliar opprobrium regarding Thomism is long gone. It is time to engage anew without trying to return to the now sterile debates about Thomism that took place in the immediate aftermath of the council. Our context is different. We are called upon to serve the church and to evangelize in a largely de-Christianized world. In this task, we as Dominicans have a certain responsibility for the intellectual life of the Catholic Church that we cannot really delegate to others. And that responsibility weighs upon us. We feel its weight, but it's also a blessing. It has the power to shape our order in wonderful ways. It can be a source of new life within our own communities and for those to whom we preach. By moving forward into renewal, we should hope in the providence of God and his intrinsically effective grace, which our own intellectual tradition so rightly underscores. I say that as a friend of the physical premotion. If we seek with God's grace to promote the wisdom of the angelic, angelic doctor, God will fructify our meager efforts. It is to us to act with hope and to find inventive ways to do so now and in the future together. The revitalization of Thomism in the order today will succeed best where it is lived out within the context of a dynamic Dominican fraternal life and evangelical preaching. First then, the integrity of principles. Second, the vitality of contemporary engagement with the thought world of our age. But third, the aspiration to live this out within the context of a dynamic community life committed to evangelization. Those are plausible aims for a Dominican Thomism after Vatican II. Thank you. <laughs>